thinking through text with technology. And uh, it's a research, my, it's my PhD research, the Department of English Literature. And it's actually a research on the digital humanities, which is uh, a branch or a field in the humanities in which we look at the, 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 the relationship that exists between uh, digital technologies and activities in, of computer scientists and scholarship in the humanities. So my research, this research is um, taking a look at the rapid uh, transformation that we have faced as scholars in the humanities as a result of uh, digital revolution with the availability of uh, several online repository, corpus and archives. And the uh, scholars in the humanities, especially digital humanists, they have developed more than over 1,500 tools in conjunction with computer scientists to actually uh, come up with how computers can actually help us to do what we do in the humanities. This situation has made a lot of scholars to question the practices, uh, whether we are going to be more like computer scientists or be like social scientists, or we're going to still retain what's characterize us as scholars in the humanities. So this research actually used one of those tools, which is Voyant tools, as an instantiation of uh, digital technologies used to read and interpret larger uh, textual data. And um, the tool was developed by Kurt Rockwell, a, a philosopher, and uh, Stefan Sinclair, computer scientist. And the tool, the job of the tool is to help scholars in the humanities to engage with tools, with uh, literary works, textbooks, especially those ones that have been digitized in a creative way to, in, to get better interpretation. And one of the things that the, the developers of the tool did was to come up with a book uh, to explain and also to give a kind of uh, the epistemological framework. In that framework, they described the tool as a magnetical tool because the book itself is emanetical, but my research is reinterpreting uh, the, the application of the tool and uh, inter using the framework of post phenomenology developed by Don Ige, I see the tool not just as em emanetical, but also embodiment. And I will explain that within the body of the work. This research is timely and relevant as we know that scholars in the humanities really, and they're curious about research in artificial intelligence and computational tools. And they're not just concerned with uh, discriminating or looking at the uh, ethical dimension or trying to uh, critique them, but they try to also appreciate uh, the fact that some of those tools can help us to filter uh, biases, prejudices, and preconception. And um, so that will take us to Boyan too. Part of the things uh, I've prepared for this presentation is to explain what Voyant 2 is all about and to demonstrate the usage. So I will share a video clip I've recorded in that regard so that we can just... So... Today's Voyant 2 you will begin by opening your browser and type buoyant hyphen to dot org. Enter. So it's going to give you the first view of the two that's existing online. And um, the next thing is to is either you add your corpus here or if you open an existing one by default, Rockwell and Sinclair, who are the developers of this tool, have already uh, placed Shakespeare's play and Austin's novels as the same existing by default. So you can pick this and um, click on open. Click open is that, or you can use corpus that you have created on your phone. So let's just say we open Voyant 2 again and it comes up as 
unusual with this and um, so we're not going to use an existing corpus so we um, upload the corpus either we have developed or you have downloaded from an existing data and it's better that it's we have that in this, this um, the text document we also accept a, a word document but it has a limited uh, format that is acceptable so let's say we know the corpus there is a corpus here of um presidential speeches so we can highlight all of them and um we wait for that to upload and once it's done it's going to give us something exactly like this that's the first framework that we get after uploading our corpus into volume two and um, can you see that so there's um the speeches of u.s presidents and um, as you can see by default the first window we get from Buoyant as a uh, five tunes, and um, here we have the cyrus too, the reader in the middle, trained summary tool, and context tools. So I'll explain these tools um, later. Um, there's also the same thing here. And you can always expand any of these tools by clicking on this and the URL for this view and it gets bigger and you can always return to, to where we have the general view. So for the sake of today's presentation, I have uh, some conferences I've been working on just to think along with those uh, texts with Boyan 2 as an institution of text analysis technology. And here we have um, as a corpus of the works of modern philosophers mostly from 17th and 18th century. And um, another corpus here of um, about 61 well-known novels written in English language by African authors in the 80s. So just working on that too, to, to look at um, interpret those novels or the use of buoyant. And here I have a great summa theology. The treatise is written by Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. And um, we have um, Shakespeare's play collection is already by default in, in buoyant tubes. And um, we have um, another corpus of the presidential speech, which I used when I was explaining how to upload corpus into the buoyant. And the last is that of Trump campaign speeches, 2016. So I'm going to use some of all this, these uh, corpus to explain the tools that are inside Boyan tools. So Boyan tool is, um, is, is made up of several tools. And as you can see, uh, five of them are visible now. You can see the rest. If we click on this icon, so we have document tools, bubble, silence, context, 
document terms, freedom, visualization, tools, corpus tools. And um, we'll just take the important one that important one that can that will help us as we as we look at any text that we can upload to to Voyant. Yeah, back to the Shakespeare's uh, corpus. Um, the five tools that are visible here, let's take them one by one. So let's begin with uh, the summary tool, which shows us um, the summary of everything in the, in the corpus. We can see that there's um, over 895 houses, 707 words. The corpus of uh, Shakespeare's play, which it's actually in the Boyan two itself. So this two just give us um, a simple textual review of uh, of this corpus, and um, the information includes uh, words and documents, and and even now the words are called in the the entire documents. So you can see that. And uh, the next two is that of uh, keyword in context, uh, just simply called context, and uh, popularly known as concordance uh, two, in a way. And uh, here we can search for a particular keyword. Let's say we we'll search for love. Well, then there's a uh, corpus. And uh, you can see it helps to analyze the meaning of the word within various contexts in which Shakespeare used it in this play. And uh, if you adjust the left, you can see more of the words in the context. And you can always increase the context or expand as you like. So this helps us to to see the word usage within any uh, literary text and to be able to see how consistent uh, in some text it depends on whether we are live in an historical text or just uh, collections of play and say evolution of idea and the author's uh, way of thinking. So we go to the trend to uh, which gives us a line graph, you know, as you can see, depicting the, the, the diagram of the, the kind of a distribution of the most uh, frequently occurring words across uh, that's Shakespeare corpus. So you can see the words shall, lord, king, sir, good, you know, in various colors, and you can notice the trend, you know across the 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 place so in the middle of a uh, buoyant two we have the reader and you wonder why, why do you still have the entire text in this um, two you yeah. know you just need to know the buoyant and uh, specifically meant for for texture interpretation so that which can only be achieved through both close and distant reading of any given literary work. But I can explain why Boyan 2 has a, a full text panel at the center, so as to give us flexibility of going from close reading to distant reading and back. And so you can already search within the, the entire text. And if you notice that. Um, you notice if we go back to the corpus, you notice that that if you make if you alter something, uh, if you alter anything in the in the document, uh, in the frequency changes in the trend, and that which is already in altered, you know, it's worth to 
show on the radar session. So the, the tools are interconnected. They're interconnected. And, and the, the radar is to make us to go back and forth. And uh, the word cloud or uh, test cloud function, which is performed by Cyrus 2, gives us a, a visual representation of text within the campus. So you can see the frequently occurring words appearing larger in the cloud, and we can always adjust, adjust the terms, increase it to actually give room for other terms that are caught frequently within the within the text to experiment with other tools is a corpus of some of the works of um, modern philosophers I have developed this corpus simply for experimentation with text this is a 25 documents and uh, 1.2 million total words. So if we take up some tools from there. You can always pick any tool you want to work with from there, from here. Let's start with Belisa. Oh, it's an experimental tool that enables the user to have a, a natural language of exchange basically in English language and uh, we can always fetch from the corpus. Let's just select randomly. It has taken something from the corpus and create on the works from public domain print divisions and and Belisa said, what do you think you're talking about? And uh, let's just speak another one. After referring to the experience of the individual man to learn the law of each of these elements that is to learn what is natural effect, blah, blah, blah. In the Belisa response, what comes to mind when you ask that? And let's speak another one. He said, what do you suppose that the same thing is? In a way, it's not a perfect conversation. It works for some text. And um, well, you're not alone. If you're chatting with Belisa, yes. this is a bot here, you know. Is asking what the speculation needs to. So it's it works well in terms of its, in its developmental stage. Next um, is um, the phase two, which shows a repeating sequence of, of words organized by frequency of repetition or number of words in uh, each repeated phrase. So we can see as, um, within those texts, just look at those um, those phrases. It's just the same words in the same order uh, often repeated and check the count and length. And, and that's important when we're working with some text and we're thinking about about the, the way the author writes and, and what the author em emphasizes. So we have the collocate uh, two, which shows uh, which terms appear more uh, frequently in proximity to keywords across the entire corpus. And uh, it gives us a count. And uh, so it goes down, down, down each word under the collocation within the corpus. Then we have the scattered plot too, which gives us a, a graph visualization of our word cluster um, in a corpus using document similarities, um, correspondence analysis, as we, we can see, and uh, correspondence. We have the, the principal component analysis, any form of analysis we do. I think this is important, especially for works that we just need those analysis within the body of our works to, to prove some things and to show how um, those um, words we, we use within the text and 
and the various relationships that um, exist. So you can always work with that, alter the terms, and use the available uh, control to 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 make our preferences. Um, similar to this tool is um, is um, the stream graph, the stream graph uh, tool. Uh, it gives us a, well, in a way, it's not playful, but it's a sort of a visual depiction of the change or the frequency uh, of words within the, the corpus. And we can always try to to alter that and focus on some of the words that we think are important and and check. So you can you can experiment with this and, and check. Um, so it's it's not doing the the work for us. It's just helping us to think, and it's not just for to show something within the body of our work when we. But it influences our interpretation, especially of large um, corpus or texts. After collecting um, the several English novels by African writers in the 80s and 90s, um, as you can see in this corpus of about five million words, just from some of those novels, um, Dumpscape 2 shows me the geography of places mentioned in this uh, novels. And it's so interesting to see that the spatial ontology of those characters goes beyond Africa. As you can notice, the movements across Europe. North America, Asia, and uh, all other places. And it's so interesting. Uh, it's such an interesting to, to actually um, app to visualize text just beyond just um, the words they mean, but also places that are also mentioned and referred to within the, the, the literary work. And, um, and see there is a corpus here of uh, Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theology, which is a very uh, popular work in the Middle Ages, with about uh, two million words in the corpus. And so interesting to see that the, the work has four parts, the premier part, the, the premier part, the second part, the second, the second and the tertiary part. And, uh, we into especially the, the bulb line you know, to have to visualize the frequency and distribution of time across the corpus, as well as you can use all of that to do your textual analysis. The, and here is the word tree too, which you can use to see how words are related to, to one another and how they're used. You can always uh, increase the context so in relation to things here, you can see these things that, you know, and how they use those things and how they were used within the work. And this is important to check out for linguistic uh, analysis and also the analysis of, of cultural and other forms of uh, literary uh, text. So if you take a look at the corpus we have here, the American uh, presidents, yeah. The speeches we can use um, to like a uh, textual arc, which gives us a visualization of terms in, you know, within those um, speeches and the corpus. And uh, we can see the, the, the way they central of terms, and there's an arc that we see here that follows the terms based on the, the documents. So it's such an interactive tool, so you can see. and. Um, it can, when you're working on any text, you can pause a while to, to think along uh, with this. And that's textual act two. So that's mandala two, it's close to that, but mandala shows the kind of the relationship in the visual way that exists between terms and documents. So you can see all the precedents here. We want to look at how they use their terms 
and the times that this one used more than the others and the, and the various ways so you can see Truman, Obama and uh, Carter, uh, Taylor and we can always explore, explore this. So that's Mandala of Mandala 2, uh, Tamberry is also here and um, I'm using that for the same corpus of presidential speeches and it provides um, a way of exploring high frequency times and the, the collocates in the world that exists in proximity to work. So you understand this better when you explore this with some other corpus available and uh, here we have uh, playful too anyway that's for visualization and also in relation to time frequency you can always give it some and uh, we can always make it again let's uh, refresh that uh, so you bring the corpus there's the corpus of uh, of trump uh, 2016 campaign speeches and uh, i brought imported that into the volume to and um, open the, the visualization and you can always do it. Wait for one. You can always um, let it just continue to use the kind of tick tock, tick tock. Let's, let's just all work and all play um, with Jack, uh, a robot. Into that for us as we think. Could you explain to us? You will begin. Thank you very much. Um, that's just a, a presentation on the on the tool. So that was. I'm going to use the tool in this um, paper to talk about human technology relationship, and uh, the tool is more or less like the case study that I'm using the research and to see how we scholars in the humanities actually uh, engage with tools to help us to think along with text and not just to give uh, graphical uh, representations. And um, I'll continue with the, the presentation by sharing my slides with uh, you to, that will lead us to the discussion. So what we have in the Voyan tool is, as I've shown, are the various tools. And um, we, it was developed by Rockwell and um, Sinclair, who are scholars in the humanities and also computer scientists. And that shows the kind of collaboration that can exist between scholars in the humanities, philosophers, historians, and others with co computer scientists, in which we are able to show uh, the methods we are using, what we are doing, and the kind of tools that could be developed that will enhance it and that can undo a uh, large quantity of text. And uh, someone asked how do I heard about the tool. You can see the free tool is available. And though I am part of a digital humanities scholarship, so I'm in direct contact also with the developers. One of the developers died last month. and. Uh, he have a degree and it's part of my PhD work. So it's not just to report the two, but I have used a post phenomenological framework, which is um, a framework in the humanities and by philosophers of technology, basically to interrogate the two. Within this framework, Don I uh, came up with four relationships that could exist between the human person and the tools that we use. The authority relationship, which focuses upon the technology itself. So for instance, in relation to the digital humanity, such relationship will exist when, if I'm, for instance, I'm using digital repository. When I'm using digital repository, I'm looking at those repository or the app that has been developed or the copy or the archive or any AI tool. So in that relationship, the tool is there and I'm also there. So we are two agents and I'm seeing uh, the, the tool as an external 
uh, body. Then the other one, the amenetic relationship, is the one that in a situation whereby I'm using the, two, the, 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 the technology as instrument just for interpretation. So in, in like when Rockwell and, uh, and uh, Sinclair developed this tool, they see the tool as simply for amenetics to help uh, scholars and humanities to interpret their texts, put it there, see various things, have broader insights, compare previous texts, ancient texts, have a quick glance at a well, large volume of text and all those stuff. But I'm also bringing up the other part which uh, Don I introduced, which is embodiment relationship. Embodiment relationship occurs in a situation whereby you and the technology are together in such a way like the example Don I used in his philosophy was the, the blind man stick. So the blind man and the stick, the, 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 the blind man is not seeing the stick as the other, but he's using the stick, the stick has become part and parcel. It's like an extension of his visual uh, capability or visual senses. And we have that in telescope too, when you're using telescope and uh, the same thing, am I in the hand of uh, a carpenter? And then the, the fourth part of relationship that Don I'd introduced, which I adopted in my engagement or interrogation of, uh, of textual analysis to it, in particular, we end to this background relationship. A situation whereby the tool you're using is existing in the background. And you can see that in the presentation of uh, Professor Chris, that it talks about all this uh, uh, technologies that take our consciousness away, and then we are drowned into, into that. Now, in the case of buoyant, you, you, you will notice that there are three epistemic agents, you know, the user, the computer, and the buoyant too. And these agents are being, that's the argument, they, they are existing on their, on their own right. So it's not like just a computer is there, no. It's, it exists, it's, it has its own being, and it has a unique role that is performing within the interpretation, in, within the context of, of interpretation. So as a human epistemic agent who is using the uh, Boyan tool uh, on my computer, I'm curious about the nature of my experience of thinking about text along with, uh, with technology. And that's it's part of one of the things that, that the research is, is actually going, is exploring and will further explore. Part of the things we try to do is what we exist when we are using the tool, because some of what these tools are doing, like Boyan tool, some of what they're doing can actually be done without using those tools by a programmer. You can use Python, you can use uh, what we call it, you can use um, R programming language to actually generate some of these analyses or to even in, in relate better than uh, Belisa with uh, the technology. And one of the things I want to do in this research, which is still going on, is to find out which one would be the best means of interrogating the text? Is it a situation where I'm using a tool already created or the context in which I have imbibed a lot of programming skills within me and I'm relating directly within the, with the tools, uh, with, the, with, with the tools uh, using uh, Python or R programming? So if you have any question, uh, I will appreciate and thank you very much.